So today we have the pleasure of hosting um, Dr. Mariam Zahabi from Texas A&M University. Um, uh, Dr. Zahabi has a PhD from North Carolina State University, and um, she's um, uh, an assistant professor at um, Texas A&M. Um, she works in the area of cognitive workload modeling. And um, Dr. Zahabi. Thank you so much, Dr. Mariam. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, I want to talk about uh, one of my projects today with you, and it's on cognitive workload evaluation of upper limb for static devices. This is a collaborative project uh, between my lab and biomedical engineering at North Carolina State University and University of Florida Computer Science and Industrial. Before I go into the detail of this project, I want to give an overview of my research. Uh, my research is focused on modeling and improvement of human performance in any type of human system interactions. Um, and in terms of the objective, uh, my objective is focused on uh, providing engineering-based solutions to have uh, effective and comfortable and safe human use of the technology. Methodology-wise, I use a combination of what I call the top-down and bottom-up research approaches. By top-down, it's my main focus on human performance modeling. Um, and then by bottom-up, um, by using algorithm, machine learning algorithms, and also um, uh, human subject experiments. So you see a combination of methodology that I use here, um, uh, human subject experiment, driving simulation studies, and virtual reality simulation. And my research so far has been funded by agencies including National Science Foundation, uh, DARPA, uh, USDOT, and AFRL, with some other internal grants. So this is a list of my ongoing projects. Uh, I'm going to talk about the EMG-based assistive human machine interface today, uh, which is funded by NSF. But I will briefly talk about some other projects uh, to give you perspective of the other work that is going on in my lab at the end of my talk. So the second one is the N my NSF Career Award, which is focused on uh, providing adaptive systems and personalized training for law enforcement. And the other one is focused on um, navigation devices for individuals with disability. But the theme of all of these projects is, again, human performance modeling and combine the top-down and bottom-up research approaches. So with that, I will move forward to the topic here today, which is focused on cognitive workload evaluation of upper limb for static devices. We have um, nearly about 2 million people experiencing um, a limb loss in the US. And they're using prosthetic devices for uh, performing activities of daily living. So these prosthetic devices require substantial amount of cognitive resources, because they have to control several degrees of freedom um, of, of these devices with shoulder movement or the EMG signals that they will have from residual muscles. So controlling these um, you know, different movements and is challenging specifically with that limited information uh, that they have. So they have, we have seen that they have difficulty in performing of these activities of living. And as a result of this difficulty, we have seen a uh, high rejection rate in, in these devices. So uh, for example, 50% of body power hook users and 39% of myoelectric hand users experience in this rejection. Uh, my talk is mainly focused of these EMG-based myoelectric hand um, users, um, mainly because they're newer as compared to uh, the body powered hook uh, devices. So I'm going to focus on cognitive workload assessment of these prosthetic devices. This is a study that when we started this project, we did. And we looked at the um, uh, cognitive workload assessment that have been used in prosthetic devices so far. So we have seen in the literature that uh, there has been a lot of use of physiological measures for measuring mental workload, like heart rate variability, cardiac responses, and uh, respiratory responses, skin conductance, and eye tracking devices. So they all have their own advantages. They have their own limitations. Um, and then we also saw studies use subjective measures, mainly using the NASA task load index, because it's easy to administer these types of uh, uh, measure at the end of the study. But it also has its own challenges, because it's subjective. It can be biased. 
And then the third group of these measures were performance measures. So performance measures, they were assessed, and they were used in two main categories. Some studies looked at the primary task, for example, when the prosthetic device user just doing the activities of daily livings, and they measured the task completion time, for example. And some other tasks, they looked at secondary cognitive tasks. So while they were performing their primary task, they gave them additional tasks, like let's say you know, the memory task or, or others. But so this was what has been done in the, in the domain so far to assess cognitive workload. What we thought that is missing is basically the model-based approaches. So we want to see if we can use models to predict this mental workload early on in the design cycle. Because uh, just assessing the mental workload after the prosthetic device is already in the use, it's late. You know, in the design cycle, we should bring it uh, when we are making the prototype to assess this mental workload. So that's you know, mainly on, this research is mainly on how we can use this top-down human performance modeling and bottom-up machine learning algorithms and combine that to be able to have an algorithm that can estimate the workload early on with, with early prototypes. So in this slide, uh, I know it's a little bit texty, but I wanted to uh, have the message that, you know, why I wanted to combine these two, human performance modeling with machine learning. Well, human performance model approaches has several advantages. It can, they can be generated from the observation of the task and using knowledge elicitation approaches. You know, we have done studies with Think Aloud with very few number of human subjects and based on the video recordings. So that's one of the advantages of that. They do not require extensive human subject experiment. They can be used, therefore, early, in earlier stages of the design cycle, which is important. And they can also provide some estimates, like task performance. They can give us estimates on the demands in terms of perceptual, uh, cognitive, and motor demands of the task. So it can help us identify the bottlenecks in the task. And that's really important, specifically when we are uh, evaluating these devices again, in early in the design cycle. And of course, we're familiar with advantages of machine learning, you know, as compared to um, inferential statistics. And also, these methods can be used in real time to provide inputs um, uh, to classify a workload. Some methods that have been used previously, you know, I listed here support vector machine, random forest, naive phase, they have been used before to classify a workload, for example, in driving domain. And uh, we have seen that these Machine learning algorithms has the capability to get multimodal input data. So for example, from physiological data, task performance data. So we think that this has a you know, good potential uh, to be incorporated with human performance models. So with that, what we've seen gapping from the literature is on the left side, and what we are trying to do is on the right side as objective. So on the left side, there hasn't been any effort on predicting cognitive workload of prosthetic devices. So we, are gonna, we wanted to propose something that can be used early on in the design cycle. There has been no use of these top-down and bottom-up approaches, so understanding of human needs early on and the behavior of human. There hasn't been any consideration of experimental costs. That's very important. So whenever we wanted to um, evaluate these prosthetic devices, we have to conduct human subject experiments. We have to collect all of these physiological responses. So that can be time-consuming and costly. So we are incorporating that here. They only used, as prior studies in this domain, only use one type of physiological measure. However, we know that there are some, you know, there is no gold standard. Each method has its own advantage, has its own limitation. So we are looking at using a, a multi-method, uh, multi-input uh, measures. And then there has been limited uh, consideration of computational time for these methods. Uh, I know this might not be a consideration with the, you know, the powerful computers that we have, but still, if you wanted to provide adaptive and you know, real-time feedback, then that can be useful. And then finally, there hasn't uh, been any um, use of, so prior studies only used one test bed. For example, they used closed pin relocation task, which is one of the very you know, famous um, test beds used in prosthetic device evaluation. But there hasn't been that much of just, uh, justification. And also, um, you know, only one test bed, it limits the generalizability of the finding. And there hasn't been any assessment of newer controls, like continuous control in priors. 
So with this gap, what we're trying to do, and of course we cannot solve all the problems in one study, but you know, we wanted to investigate the use of multimodal input features uh, to uh, classify cognitive workload of using these prosthetic devices. And we wanted to, uh, to consider this experimental uh, cost and computational intensity of it as well. And then we wanted to also compare the existing EMG-based prosthetic devices. And not only with one test bed, but also based on multiple test beds. And I will talk extensively about how we selected these test beds. That's important. And then so we hope at the end of this uh, project, which is this is just one of the pro uh, studies in line of uh, this research, we wanted to inform further human-centered design and uh, application of prosthetic tests. So with this objective in mind, I want to jump into the experiment. So this was a human subject experiment. It's a three by two mixed design. And we didn't, so we use able-bodied subject instead of uh, amputee patients. And the reason for that, there were two reasons mainly. One was the number of prosthet uh, prosthetic users in the area was very limited. Uh, so we couldn't have this sample size that we estimated. Um, but the other reason is that most of the prosthetic device users, they're using the direct control mode. So that could have biased. Uh, the study uh, as well, because they were familiar with one type, and we have comparing it with uh, two other modes as well. So that's why we decided to go with able-bodied subject. You can see the distribution of uh, gender, both female and male, uh, age distribution here. They didn't have any experience in participating in studies with uh, prosthetic devices before. They were all right-handed, and they didn't have any uh, dexterity issues. And then the prosthetic device, you can see, is a commercial two degrees of freedom prosthetic device. This is a work of my collaborator, Dr. Helen Huang, who is from biomedical engineering at NC State, uh, who built these prosthetic devices. We made it so able-bodied subject can use it, but it still you know, serves the functionality of getting the uh, inputs from the residual muscles. And we control the three uh, different schemes. Uh, one was a direct control algorithm. Uh, method, the other one was pattern recognition, and the last one was continuous control. I want to give you an idea of uh, what our different uh, controls are. So first, um, I want to look about the gestures. So this is the prosthetic movement that you can see here. It can open, close. It can also supinate and pronate. And in the direct control mode, which was the early on method that has been used, so if the, if the, uh, the participant extend their hand, the, the, uh, the hook would open. If they flex it, the hook would close. But then it only has one degree of freedom. So they have to do co-contraction in order to activate the other mode of control. So they do co-contract or power grip, and then the mode changes. And now with the same gestures, they have to do um, you know, uh, supination and pronation. So as you can see, this can be challenging because they need to keep in mind which mode they are at at each time when they are performing these tasks. So that's, that was we expected initially that this would you know, provide, uh, lead to high, more, uh, high workload. And then the pattern recognition and continuous control, you can see this relationship between uh, the hook movement. So if they open, the device would open, the hook would open. If they close the hand, the hook would close. They didn't have any, oops, sorry, they didn't have any mode change here. So it was more intuitive. When they supinate, uh, they, uh, supinate their hand, the device would supinate, and then when they pronate, the device would pronate. The difference between the power recognition and continuous control, I mean, the gestures are the same, but the difference was that in the pattern recognition, they can only, it has one degree of freedom, so it can only open or close, or they can do supinate or pronate. But in the continuous control, they can do both at the same time. So it has, it's, it's been, uh, by looking at it, it seems to be more intuitive as compared to just having uh, one degree of freedom. So I talked about the main differences between three modes that we tested. And these are you know, the sensor uh, locations, the EMG sensor locations for, um, uh, for these devices. So for uh, DC, for direct control, we only need these two muscles. Um, uh, and then for the uh, PR and the continuous control, we need all of these four sensors. So that's the, f the fundamental differences in terms of the functionality. And then I said in previous studies, uh, mostly all of them use one test bed, um, and there was no you know, just clear justification of why this test bed needs to be used. So we did a study in 2020 by looking at the 
different um, test beds that are available to assessing prosthetic devices. We did sensitivity analysis, and we also mapped these um, test beds, the different movements that uh, you know, participants would need when they perform these tasks. We mapped them with the fundamental upper limb movements. So from our review and analysis, we found this closed spin relocation task and the uh, SHAP door handle specifically, the door handle task to be sensitive to identify the differences between um, different configurations of prosthetic devices, but also the movements that the, uh, the human subject need for performing these tasks, they map directly to real world activities. For example, like steering, that they need you know, uh, flexion, ex extension, abduction, abduction, and other movements. So in the closed spin, uh, they needed to uh, pick a pin from the horizontal rod uh, uh, and then move it to the vertical bar. So it's just movement from horizontal to vertical. And then in the shaft door handle, it's just you know, approaching the door handle, rotate it 90 degree, and then quick uh, release it as soon as possible. So these were the, you know, the tasks that we decided to, to use because of this analysis. And we used two test beds instead of one to see if it actually matters uh, when we're looking at different test beds. So this is a procedure of our study uh, after they went through the informed consent form and demographic information. We tested their dexterity level, they, and we also tested their right-handedness. And then we went to the prosthetic calibration. Um, so um, our study, in terms of using the prosthetic device, was a between subject. So each subject only experienced one uh, prosthetic device. The reason for doing that was that we wanted to avoid fatigue uh, that might have caused as a result of this um, uh, study. So they practiced with that one specific prosthetic device, and then they, they received the visual feedback, whether it's following what they're doing. And if they were comfortable, we move forward to the training. So in the training session, um, we defined the cr uh, criteria for training for them because we wanted to make sure that participants are all comparable in their performance before, before they start. So uh, this training uh, criteria is specifically for the close spin relocation task. Um, and this was generated from our pilot test. Um, so we looked at the learning curve uh, of, of these, and when they, received, when they reached a plateau of their performance, that was the criteria that was developed. So for example, for the pattern recognition, if the participant could, do, uh, could move three pins from the horizontal bar to the vertical bar between 15 and 25 seconds, then we said, okay, this participant passed it. And similar criteria was developed for DC direct control and, um, and continuous control. And then we did our eye tracking calibration, and after that, participant went to the test session. Went to the test session. So uh, we had two tasks, CRT and SHAP, and in the close spin relocation, we asked the participant to move uh, the pins as quickly as possible within two minutes. And the, the variable that we measured is the number of pins that they moved in two minutes. And then they also filled out the NASA TLX after each trial, which is a measure of our mental workload. It's a subjective measure. We use it as a ground truth here. And then uh, they also performed the SHAP task. In SHAP task, uh, they want, we wanted them to move the handle five times um, as fast as possible. So the time was a dependent variable. So um, basically, we measured how much time it took them to um, do it this task. And then we have the brief. So I wanted to uh, show a list of an uh, example of the input features that was uh, uh, put into the algorithm. So we had device configuration because prior studies have shown that differences in the functionality of these devices might have an impact on mental workload. So that was one of our inputs. We put pupillometry measures as a physiological measure of workload, specifically using pupil size uh, change and also the blink rate. The reason why he selected these two is that it's not that sensitive to the motion that much. And in the experiment, participants needed to move their body and hand a lot. So we wanted to choose a method that is um, more stable. And then we also incorporated task performance measures in the model. We got it from the video analysis. So that included uh, the performance of the task, the number of training trials that they needed to pass the training threshold. And also we looked at the completion time of one cycle. And so here's the place that I incorporated that human performance modeling as inputs. 
So uh, the CPM or cognitive performance model outcomes, we use the uh, method CPM GOMS approach because it allows for parallel activities and uh, so that was the activities that we saw in the, in the task as well, of people performing several tasks in parallel. Uh, and we use a coagulator software for that. And these are some of the outputs that we get from the model. Uh, and I will provide more detail in this slide, actually. So from these team and performance models, i just give an example here. Um, we get the metrics of uh, perceptual demand, cognitive demand, and motor demand of, of these tasks. Task completion time is another measure from the model. And we also get an estimate of memory load. How was you know, demanding this task was to, to the operator? And you can see this is a PERT chart from that coagulator software. And it's just one portion of the task that we model. So on the, on the horizontal axis, you see time. And on the vertical axis, you see different operators. So there are perceptual operators, cognitive operators, and motor operators. So for example, this part of the task is just moving a pin from bar A to bar B. And so the, the participant needs to first flex their hand because they needed to do some adjustment to the hook. And then they have to move. And some operators, we have to define it our own. So it's not already in the literature of human performance modeling. So we, we created these operators move because they have to move uh, you know, to be able to pick the pin. And then they look at the pin. They recall from their memory, OK, now what type of gesture I need to do to open the hook to grab it. And then they grasp it. Recall from memory now what I need to do to you know, flex or uh, move, the, uh, move the prosthetic hook, and then so on. So it continues. So you see, this is a very detailed analysis, but it can be done with just observation of, uh, you know, let's say, one subject who is expert in the task. So that's really the benefit of, of these types of models. And then in the bottom, you can see the memory chunks. And here, it's, it gives us an estimate of, OK, this, portion, this task took about nine seconds. And it also, in terms of workload, it was not that demanding because it was only you know, 2.9 chunks of memory load. So we use this output from this model as some of the input features into the machine learning algorithm. So in terms of a target variable of our study, we wanted to estimate cognitive workload. So that was our target variable. The ground truth, we use NASA task load index, uh, which is a, a subjective uh, a workload assessment that has been used a lot and validated in different domains. Um, and participated rated the NASA TLX uh, the score um, after each trial. So we have a, a number on that. In order for us to uh, classify uh, the, ground, uh, the data, we needed to do the data labeling. So we did some clustering analysis to find the optimal numbers of classes uh, for, for this NASA TLX. So our results show that. Uh, from clustering analysis showed that having two classes of workload, high or low, or having three classes, high, moderate, low, or having four classes, high, moderate, low, and very low classes of workload are the best you know, uh, classes from, from, uh, for, uh, for these uh, NASA TLX. We also did intuitive classification as well. Just by looking at the distribution of the data that we got, uh, we just, you know, uh, one of my collaborators actually said, why don't we do it intuitively, you know, and just uh, cluster the data based on that. So we have intuitive four classes as well, high, moderate, low, and very low. So we use this because at the end, we wanted to estimate the cognitive workload and say whether it is high or low or high or moderate and so on. And uh, there are three algorithms we tested in this study, uh, random forest, support vector classifier, and naive base. The reason why we used these algorithms was that because they have shown to have high pr uh, prediction accuracy, specifically with the small data sets, which uh, for our study, because it was the first study that we collected the data in this domain, uh, that was interesting. And they also have been used including physiological data and performance data. As we, so we found it to be suitable uh, to be used in our um, in our study. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the inferential statistics to get an idea first, and then I'll go to the model uh, to discuss uh, more. So uh, in terms of task performance, you know, we found that the pattern recognition actually um, outperformed the direct control measure. And you can see here, but this is only for the close pin relocation task. There hasn't been any significant uh, difference in the, in the SHAP task. And the reason was that when we look at the, uh, the, when we did the cognitive modeling of CRT, it was actually needed more adjustments of the hook. So it was more demanding and more perceptual demand 
but the shaft task, they just need to grab the handle and then rotate it. So it's a, you know, it doesn't require mm, uh, that specific adjustment. So that we believe that this, uh, the difference is because of that. And then in terms of our workload measures, the percent, uh, percentage change in pupil size, we found that the DC, which is the green bar here, um, was more demanding as compared to the continuous control. Um, again, you know, it, this was ex expected based on the functionality uh, of, of these devices. And then the blink rate, uh, we saw, you know, uh, not the effect of the task, uh, not the effect of the control mode, but the effect of the task. And that's important because this was the first study that used multiple test beds. So we found that the, the CRT blink rate is actually higher, uh, lower than shaft. That means that, so when you experience more workload, your blink rate decreases in visual wor workload uh, activities. So that shows that the CRT was actually more challenging task as compared to the door handle shaft task. And we see the same trend uh, with the NASA TLX. So if you look at the last NASA TLX, we saw that the CRT was also people rated it as being more demanding, cognitively demanding as compared to um, the shaft. So this is a summary of inferential statistics to get an idea of what happened in the experiment. But I want to move forward to uh, the models as well. So we define good models based on prior studies as having three properties. 70% um, accuracy at least, uh, area under curve of uh, above 0.85, and the precision of above 0.7. So if you look at this uh, table, and this is just some of the best performed models that we just put together here. We didn't put all the models here in this slide. But um, you can see the, the asterisk, the models with asterisks are the ones that they met this criteria. Uh, so based on this criteria, they're good models. In general, we found that having a smaller number of classes led to better classification, and that's intuitive. Because you know, just classifying based on low and high workload, it gives you better results as compared to go very low, low, moderate. So, and then one thing that is very interesting: uh, if we don't consider experimental cost and computational intensity, the random forest algorithms with two classes were actually the winners because they had higher accuracy. Um, so they were the winners. But I want to pay attention to the model number nine, which was a naive base. It was an acceptable model based on this criteria. It didn't have this very high random forest. But you know, later on, I will focus on other aspects of this model. Um, so random forest here, it seems to be the winner. We also looked at the grid search time uh, for these algorithms. And oh, actually, this is uh, a slide before that. So yeah, so I want to talk about the feature importance. That's where I think you know, the outcomes of human performance models is important. Because we found that in the, in the best models, in the random forest models, the features that were selected included the task time for one cycle of the task and these two operators, cognitive operators and also the motor operators. These are the CPM, the model outcomes, and also the number of training tools to be important. And then in the selected features in the best model for the SHAP was the time for, for one cycle. So one thing that's very interesting, physiological measures of workload were not selected in the final model as important features. So that's something that was interesting from our study. In terms of computational intensity, we look at the grid search time. So this is a training time for the model. And I know the data set was very small, uh, so, that the, so it doesn't show its significance here, but you know, with larger data sets, then we see you know, more difference probably between these algorithms. So when uh, considering this computational intensity, the support vector machine and naive base actually worked better as compared to the random forest. Um, and the uh, SFS, um, sequential feature uh, selection, it actually was uh, more time consuming. But when we consider all of the accuracy and you know, the performance that I showed in the previous table here, if we consider this, model nine was uh, still acceptable. And here we see that you know, the computational cost is it's less than the random forest. Uh, we haven't done you know, a statistical analysis to, you know, to look at this with larger data set, but with even a small data set like this, we showed that naive base you know, uh, was the best in terms of both performance and also its computational intensity for training the model. So model number nine. 
The other component that, I added, that we added to this was the experimental cost. So we have three categories of high, moderate, low. If the features that we included in the model included pupillometry data, we, we categorize that high experimental cost. Why? Because you know, uh, incorporating these in the studies, first of all, require extensive human subject experiments, require controlling the environment. So that's why we grouped it as high. For moderate, work, uh, for moderate experimental cost, if the feature included only task performance measure, we, we said that it's moderate. Why? Because it still needs human subject experiments to be able to get this task data but it doesn't require physiological data collection. So that's a little bit less than, less cost experimentally than this category. And for the low category, if the features only included the model out, uh, outcomes, so from the CPM, because it can be generated from the models, it's not expensive and it doesn't require human subject experiment, we categorize it as low. So looking at, again, that table that I just showed, but now with the classification of experimental cost. So these asterisk models, these are the best performed models based on the performance itself. But then you can see that some of them were actually having moderate experimental costs, the ones that they did not include physiological measures in them, but it still has high accuracy. And again, you see this model number nine uh, in this category as well. So model number nine was the model that has acceptable performance based on the criteria, it has lower computational intensity as compared to the others, and now it has moderate uh, uh, experimental cost. There was one row that has low experimental cost that we really hope this would be a winner, but uh, this didn't have high performance. So models, so that tells us that models itself, uh, you know, could not classify workload that much, but with incorporation with task performance, it actually improved. So what do, I, what do we learn from this study? We learned that the cognitive performance model and task performance features were good to classify cognitive workload with acceptable accuracy. And you know, we found that including the CPM features uh, in the machine learning is important because they do not require extensive human subject experiments. They can quantify and estimate human behavior with, in simple tasks using softwares like Cogulator and Cocktool. And my lab uh, also put together a, a, a new version on R, uh, which is, we call it a Novice Cognitive Performance Model, or NCPM. It's available on GitHub. So it's easily accessible, and it also can improve prediction accuracy. The second main conclusion was that the pupillometry measures were not selected in the best model. So one reason might be the tasks were easy and they were not very you know, uh, demanding, which might have caused this prior studies that showed that in either, you know, it, an easy uh, um, task, the mental workload using pupillometry measures might not be effective. And the studies in driving domain um, found that you know, behavioral measures were more promising than eye tracking measures when we were classifying cognitive workload. And prior studies, uh, one of the studies from Dr. McDonald, combining physiological measures and behavioral data did not, not improve the classification accuracy as compared to just having. Oh. Sorry about all of the arrows. Speak. <laughs> yeah. So we found that the random forest uh, would be the best algorithm in terms of performance. However, considering performance, computational time, and experimental cost, uh, we believe that naive base has the potential uh, to be used. So. We hope that the algorithm can be used to classify cognitive workload of EMG prosthetic devices in early design uh, cycle. So of course, my study has some limitations. The first one, of course, being the uh, using the able-bodied subjects. And I said the reasons why, due to the limited number of amputee patients uh, in the environment. And we only tested this algorithm with three, with three uh, EMG-based prosthetic devices. But we are hoping that the method can be used to estimate the workload for future design of prosthetic device. So I wanted to give you an idea of what we are doing in the second phase of this project. So we, this, we did this uh, study on the actual prosthetic devices. Now we are moving to the virtual reality. And we just finished the data collection last week for this. So uh, we uh, simulated this in virtual reality. You can see the close relocation task and the door uh, and the door handle task. 
So we hope that with this virtual reality, there's a no need for doing that, using that you know, uh, prosthetic device so it's easily accessible for clinicians to do these evaluations early on. And we are planning to um, uh, use our model uh, and validate it with this virtual reality as well. So there is uh, room for using this if found to be, we haven't analyzed the data yet, but if found to be useful, and this has the potential to be used uh, for training. And if I have time, I want to also talk about um, some of the ongoing projects so, uh, in my lab. And because they're all, you know, they're different areas, but they're all connected with the idea of human performance modeling. So uh, this is uh, the first project is my career uh, project, which is focused on adaptive in vehicle systems and personalized training for law enforcement officers. So this is the big, uh, you know, uh, the existing knowledge and what we are doing in this, in this study. We just finished the first one uh, this year. And so what we have seen is that there are models, human performance models, for predicting the behavior of expert users in different domains. But uh, these models may not be applicable to predicting novices' behavior. And novices, in terms of human information processing uh, uh, model, they have differences in perceptual you know, demand, in, in cognitive, and in decision making, and response. So our model, um, we looked at into specific areas of the differences between novices and experts, and we exp expanded that modeling, uh, CPM modeling. Um, so again, one thing that we did is that a lot of these models, they're on softwares that some of them are not available anymore. Um, but um, we have developed a tool in R that we are hoping that people can use so it's accessible, more accessible for research. And then in phase two of this, which is current, we are currently in, uh, we are looking at using this uh, cognitive model prediction to be able to adapt in vehicle technology. Because right now in police, um, um, in, in vehicle technology, Nothing is speak to each other. So each device is for own. It doesn't understand the context of, for example, if I'm driving in pursuit situation or I'm driving in normal patrol situation, it doesn't understand that. So we hope that using this human performance modeling top-down machine learning again, we can estimate workload and then provide adaptations in real time. And this is a picture of um, how we are incorporating, uh, we plan to in phase three, incorporate the physiological response and driving performance into the driving simulator with the inclusion of the cognitive performance models. And then uh, the second project, I'm working with a team with electrical engineering at Wichita State. Uh, it's on uh, inclusion, uh, inclusive location-based uh, navigation devices. So we see a lot of navigation devices uh, for individuals with disabilities for outdoor navigation. Uh, there are a few for indoor navigation, but they are mainly designed for, for one type of disability. There has been studies on uh, apps or navigation apps for people with visual impairment or with mobility impairment. But we, have, uh, we know that a lot of uh, patients with disabilities, they have multiple disabilities. So the goal here is that how we can you know, design in uh, navigation device uh, or navigation app for indoor navigation for people with multiple disabilities. So we finished user testing with people with different disabilities and older adults uh, with cognitive impairment, for example. We gather the idea, we design a prototype, and the next step for us is with electrical engineering, uh, they implement that inside several buildings on campus to be able to use that. The third project is funded by DARPA. And it's on knowledgeable task guidance in extremes. So again, the idea behind it is how we can estimate workload uh, in real time and provide task guidance, specifically in extreme situations. For example, when the soldier uh, needs a recommendation of how to treat, uh, let's say, a patient on the field, for example. Um, so this is, this is the general view of what we are doing with that um, you know, combination of machine learning and modeling. One thing that uh, we, we use a new approach for labeling the data by using cognitive performance model outcomes and self-reports. So we are not only using it, let's say NASA TLX here, we also look at these models to give us an estimate of, of workload. And this is my student using uh, Empatica E4, uh, which is a, uh, gathers um, 
skin response, uh, skin conductance response and heart rate, and also eye tracking devices. And the, and the code that he put together, they can predict cognitive work. So here he's showing it in just a simple uh, writing uh, task. But we are actually, we just bought equipment this week to look at the cooking task. That's the first phase for this DARPA project. Uh, so we have different recipes, uh, and we wanted to re uh, implement that with augmented reality for cooking. So whenever, let's say, a, partic uh, a participant uh, misses a step or don't know the procedure, then we say, aha, huh, this is a place that you, know, you need to put salt in it, for example. So it's a very early on simulation, but we hope that later on we can go into the extreme situations for it. And my fourth project, we are about to finish this. Um, uh, this was a two-year project from safety. Um, and it was focused on analysis of um, police and vehicle technologies. Uh, we did um, surveys and focus groups uh, with police officers to, because they have this advanced driver assistance systems in their vehicle, but most of them they said that we don't know how to use it, and they just turn it off during the emergencies. So we, f we did this survey and conducted this technology acceptance modeling. We found you know, significant relationships between training, the need for training, and their behavioral intention to use this technology. We also found that they don't trust this technology, especially in high demand situations. Um, and so there is a need to work on that, and also the training might affect their usefulness of this technology. And my student, this is an image from the dissertation of uh, one of my students, Farzaneh. Uh, so based on this survey study, she uh, simulated driving uh, simulation to test whether these ADAS technologies can be helpful in police situations. This is the first time that we have simulated a pursuit situation. Um, so there's a car in front going very fast and then they're catching it basically and at the same time they have some hazards on the road. And then um, the fifth project is a collaboration between public health uh, and computer science and our department. So I'm involved in a and this uh, uh, project as well is focused on real-time adaptive uh, procedural. And it's the main domain is oil and gas, uh, gas industry. But again, the concept is on using human performance model outcomes and then use that as a basis for giving cues and monitoring. Because procedures for these operators, they're like um, text-based right now. And they're just not adaptive at all. So they go through different steps. It doesn't matter if you're expert or if you're a novice, for example. Um, so and then we, uh, our goal is to be able to provide adaptive feedback uh, to them based on uh, the combination of uh, the study that I do and the studies that my collaborators do in terms of understanding the domain of the, the, the task itself. So where my future research is. So um, one of the future lines that I really wanted to go is uh, design for individuals with disabilities in assistive technology. And uh, this is one of the ideas that we submitted. And actually, um, Tony is part of this proposal as well. So we submitted this to uh, NIA uh, in the summer. And we're working on the revision on that. So we, uh, we wanted to be able to enable individuals with um, disabilities to use automated vehicles. Our focus is on people with cognitive impairment and older adults. We have done, based on an internal grant that we, uh, I had, uh, we focused on getting feedback from these older adults, and not only from them, but also their caregiver and other stakeholders in industry, in transportation, and also in the health system. So we have all of this data about their opinion, about what they want to see, and we developed some very early on prototypes of how the system should look like, but we want to go for a larger grant to be able to implement that. So that's one of the things that I see myself going into uh, in near project. And because I have worked in a law enforcement uh, domain for a while since my dissertation, that's one of my passions as well that I want to continue. So um, I wanted to go into the advanced VR virtual reality simulations based training for LEOs. We learned a lot of lessons from all of these observations of you know, their driving, um, uh, what they, from their simulations that we did. Um, and we know we have an idea of their needs and their perception of the technology. And one of the big gaps that we heard from uh, incorporating with these people is training. So the training is costly. There's time consuming. It's time consuming. So we are, uh, and one of our studies, um, we developed a framework for this adaptive virtual reality-based simulation. So uh, one of the domains that I see myself going to 
with law enforcement officers is submitting a proposal to be able to uh, expand uh, that uh, uh, area. And last but not least, I wanted to thank um, National Science Foundation for fi funding this project, uh, which was focused on the prosthetic devices, and my uh, wonderful graduate students uh, and the collaborators on this project as well. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much for that um, very interesting talk. Since I have the microphone, I'll ask the first question. <laughs> um, uh, so um, this uh, uh, concept of taking um, your, your GOMS model, um, mm -hmm. where you actually look at the task and characterize the, um, uh, the, the task parameters mm -hmm. without having a, you know, your low model, without having you know, a person actually doing the task is something that, that we're interested in our lab because we're looking at trying to assess the workload for manufacturing tasks mm -hmm. with, um, without actually having a person do the task. Yes. Um, but you found that you couldn't use that model mm -hmm. um, alone. But I'm just wondering, since the variable um, in your medium ta um, uh, model mm -hmm. was, was you know, performance, and it was performance time. Yes. Could you simply plug in mm -hmm. um, cycle time or task time mm -hmm. um, without, you know, measuring how much time a person actually takes, mm -hmm. but how much time is, al is allocated to the task to assess the workload? Mm, I see. Yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we found that task performance is one of the features that's found to be important in the final model. And in the cognitive performance modeling, there is a room for defining, we call it the user-defined operators. So basically, you can add if um, there is an operator or there is a task that um, there is no defined time for it or there is a not defined, um, let's say, operator for it. You can user-define it and basically say that, well, this is a new task that I'm dealing with and this is an estimate of task completion time that it takes. And then it helps the model generate more, um, uh, more I would say closer data to the actual reality. So the answer that yes, it's possible to do that. Uh, in this study, we only relied on the model specific outputs. Um, we didn't incorporate the, um, the results from the, let's say, you know, performing these tasks. Uh, the results might have been different if we, if we do that as well. But it is possible to my knowledge to do that, yes. Uh, I guess just one quick follow-up. Did you do any validation on those models? Yes. So, um, so in these models, we have validated in different domains. Uh, so for my dissertation, I actually use these cognitive models. We validated with the um, data from the police uh, drivings. And in my career project, we actually validated this model with the data that we got from the ride alarms and then with a benchmark model from the calculator. And we found that with the actual data, there was no significant difference, but the model actually produced significantly better outcomes as compared to prior models, like um, the, the CPM GOMS. So that's uh, one of the examples of validation. Here, we haven't done the validation. It's just based on um, using this model, yes. Thanks for your interesting presentation. I have two short questions. Sure. So when you presented the experiments, uh, the, the subjects did the clothespin test first, mm -hmm. and then they did the SHAP door handle test next? Uh, it was actually only because of the presentation, how I did it, but it was actually, uh, they could do it either. You okay, know? that so was kind of my the question. Order, the order was randomized, so I just okay. showed it here because, it, it, you know, I just okay. wanted to show it. Well, thank you for that. Things. Yeah, that yeah. was going to be my question. Did yeah. it make a difference? Yeah. The second question is that you mentioned at the beginning that one of the benefits of the human performance modeling is that you can provide input in the design yes. phase of the devices. So based on these experiments that you did, suppose I am the manufacturer of that mm -hmm. prosthetic, yes. what specific guidance or uh, suggestions do you have to improve the design that will reduce the workload? Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, so we hope that because the final models that we got rely on two things mainly as a features. One was the CPM outcomes and another one was task performance. So we hope that uh, these, ta these performance responses and these models can be collected early on with just a prototype. And with uh, virtual reality, because we are putting the EMG sensors at the same locations that the actual prosthetic devices was. So if our virtual reality simulation uh, validates the model that we have, then the clinicians or the industry uh, 
folks, they can just um, use this virtual reality, um, create this model for that, and then use the algorithm that we have to estimate what kind of, what the workload would be at the end when we have the actual prosthetic device. So our hope is to incorporate this model with the virtual reality to be able to be used in earlier stages of the design cycle um, to predict work. So instead of just having the, so this study was based on the final outcome, the, the prosthetic device itself. But we hope to move a little bit closer to the beginning of the design cycle with the product. So great talk, really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question about the modeling. Sure. And both GOMS and ACT are, are modeling techniques that have been developed for HCI applications oftentimes, yes. more cognitive without somebody actually connecting to the world. Um, ACTAR yes. PM perceptual motor was mm -hmm. an augmentation to ACTAR to try and deal with some of that perceptual motor yes. modeling. I'm curious, given your focus, it seems a lot of the um, interesting stuff is in the perceptual motor, particularly with the prostheses yes. and even driving with the police officers. I'm curious, as you've been adopting GOMS to do this work, have mm -hmm. you had to adapt it um, yes. to address things like, I don't know, co-contraction <laughs> and yes. muscle tremor that yes. is really low level and I don't think it just, uh, well, considered right. by ACTAR and uh, GOM. So any thoughts on how you've adapted these models? Yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, unfortunately, these models and the library of operators that are available in these models, they are limited. And as you said, they're based on human-computer interaction studies, mainly you know, back in the day with display analysis, for example. So what we, in, in our approach, we use user-defined operators. For, so we observe different tasks. We, get, you know, we analyze that based on the hierarchy of task analysis and cognitive task analysis. We break it down, okay, what type of movements it requires, what type of uh, you know, uh, perceptual demand it might require to look at it, for example, to search for something. And then we create our own operators based on that. So in a, a lot of my research, we actually use this user-defined to be able to uh, cope with the problem that we just talked about. And then it, there's another limitation that for the career project, there hasn't, been, there hasn't been any effort on the expert mod, on the novice modeling. So we, we try to, you know, for example, CPM GOMS, it's, you know, it has parallel activities, and parallel activities happens when people have expertise in a specific task. They do everything in parallel. So we broke that down a little bit as well to look at, okay, what are the fundamental differences between novices and experts? Um, again, you know, adding these um, um, operators and also, uh, you know, um, um, a little bit um, um, expanding the time for that. Because, for example, if you're an expert, you will do tasks very fast for, for different activities. So we inflated that task time uh, for the novice operators based on the observations that we have. Um, so that's, um, that's how we cope with it uh, so far. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding this uh, uh, integration about a co cognitive model and also the domain knowledge. In particular, just curious, uh, uh, can you elaborate more how these two parts are integrated together? Mm -hmm. uh, it is especially in the design of your cognitive uh, experiments, is it an yes. iterative process? Is For example, it, it is an iterative process, uh, yes. it's like a one-time design. Mm -hmm. um, because based on the prediction model, you may find it's not accurate enough, then it can guide you to collect more of the experiments. Mm -hmm. So to inform the model, oh, it's like just a mm -hmm. one-time design based on whatever you know uh, about the domain. Yes. yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, so in this project, we use cognitive modeling to as with the hope that it will improve the accuracy of the machine learning algorithm by just incorporating those features in the model uh, instead of just relying on physiological data and task performance data, for example. So it was early on integration as to finding the features for this model. So that was the idea behind this. But uh, in, in my DARPA project, we are incorporating cognitive models a little bit late in the process. So the features in that project is all from the physiological responses, the task performances, so it's a behavior of human, but as a basis to validate, uh, so when we classify uh, to, to label the data, we also incorporate the CPM outcomes. 
because CPM can give us an estimate of how um, you know, the task is you know, in, in terms of demand, what are the bottlenecks are. So that can give us an estimate of workload, and then we get an estimate from the human subject based on the physiological data, but that's kind of like a comparing the accuracy of the model. So that's a little bit late. So, so far we have been doing this as input measure or as a labeling technique. Uh, but I think it has potential uh, to be used, uh, as you said, this was an experiment that we designed first and then collected this data. So I, I hope that you know, we reach to the point that we have reliable models and that's my hope, that are reliable models that can be used earlier stages of design cycle without having the human subject experiment, and that can predict uh, the mental workload. Uh, but we haven't done, so, so far all of my studies, human subject experiment was there still when we have the model, and ma mainly it was for validation uh, of, yes. Well, well, uh, Mm -hmm. Right. That, yeah, that's an excellent point. So in, in these data, we collected data from you know, people with uh, different gender, with different demographics, and we incorporated uh, you know, the features from everybody to be able to use that for models. Uh, but, you know, my career project is actually the third phase of it, is providing personalized solution. So we are hoping that, so, so far we have trained the model based on the input from everybody, right? Uh, but we are hoping to get personalized, so each model is actually trained on the performance of that one person, to be able to provide personalized solution. That's one thing that I, I'm hoping to do, but this data is based on the aggregate of all, all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Um, my question was about, um, in one of your slides, you talk about traditional methods for evaluating workload, mm -hmm. which would be physiological yes. measures, subjective measures, and then dual task performance. Right? And then you talk about the modeling, your modeling approach yes. in addition to that. And, I'm, and the way you present it in that diagram is your modeling approach is a on the side, it's mm -hmm. one of those, yes. now it's four. Is that really how you vision your model, or is your model overlay on those other three? I'm trying to understand yes. your, how your model applies. Thank you, yeah. yeah. So I see, so that was only, it was not intentional to so, show that on the side. It was just that what, what is new here. But um, so all of these other methods, there has been like evaluation methods of workload so far. So they are being done in human subject experiment studies after, you know, the prosthetic device is, you know, the end user is using it, you know. And so what we are hoping to do with this model, again, is not only do that, it can do its evaluation with inferential statistics, but we also bring it into the prototype phase. Uh, so my, my hope is the model can be early on evaluation and then for user studying, we can do user st testing and at the end as well. So I, I think that it saves time, it saves you know, a lot of cost if we just use a model to predict and have some estimates of workload and then be able to do user testing. So because a lot of, unfortunately when we have seen a lot of prosthetic users that are using the direct control mode, they're not happy with it, they cannot use it for daily activities, I think it's too late at that point. Uh, so I, my hope is that these models can be used early on. Yes. Let's thank Dr. Zahabi again for thank an excellent you. talk. Thank you so much.